Well, good evening, everyone. I want to give you a warm welcome to our service this evening. Uh, for those in the hall here, it's good to see you. Different evening from yesterday, a bit cold out there, but as long as it stays dry, uh, we'll be fairly happy. And for the folk uh, in their own home online, we want to give you a welcome too. So we're going to sing a couple of choruses first, so keep your seats and uh, while others gather in. But uh, we do want to give you a welcome to our service this evening. And the first chorus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another. It's not a choice, it's a commandment that we love one another and also that we love God. So as, let's just think in these words as we sing tonight. And we're going to sing now, uh, The Lord is my shepherd. I'll walk with him always. Uh, he leads me in green, by green pastures. I'll walk with him always. So let's, let's sing. I think we could sing that again. And I think you can bring Descant into that, can't you? <laughs> right, ladies, let's have a go at it then. I'll not be helping you. <laughs> We're going to stand to sing uh, our first hymn, and a welcome to those that come in while we're singing choruses. So, uh, thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. And as we sing this, remember, we are not our own. We are bought with a price, and we want to thank the Lord for the price he paid. So, we'll stand to sing, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid.
Thank you for that singing. Now, before I hand over to Alistair, we're going to uh, 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 do the announcements. I was hoping to see Mike uh, for the list this morning, so <laughs> Mike, you keep me right if I miss anything here, please. <laughs> Uh, we're meeting around the Lord's table after our service this evening, so if you know and love the Lord, you'd be very welcome to join with us in the Lord's table and think of the words of that last time we were singing. Uh, diagonal nominations for, uh, need to be in by tonight. Uh, our members' meeting is coming up on the 8th of October, so that's a month away. Uh, uh, Brian McFall and John Strange's two-year term or three-year terms uh, is completed at that meeting. So nominations for the diagonal, at there's two vacancies to be filled, need to be in by tonight. Uh, then tomorrow evening, uh, Deacon's meeting at 8 p.m. And we're hoping Alistair's heading down or hoping to head down to Nigel uh, Father's funeral tomorrow. And that's Kilkenny, so a bit of a drive for him. And uh, uh, so hopefully everything will go with that. We can remember Alistair on the roads uh, tomorrow. Uh, so the Deacons meet at 8 p.m. tomorrow evening. Then on uh, also tomorrow evening, uh, there's a clean-up for mums and tots. I'm um, looking, Joan, that right? Yes, is that 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock. Uh, in preparations for mums and tots starting again on Tuesday morning at half past 10. So we need to be in prayer for that and for the different activities starting up again. Tuesday evening, there's no choir practice. Uh, it has been cancelled. Then Wednesday evening, prayer meeting at 8 p.m. And then on Thursday, uh, the funeral of Pastor John Galt takes place in Larne Baptist Church at 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Uh, our own, I'm getting mixed up here, sorry. Uh, our own prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 p.m., and then Thursday morning our prayer meeting at 10 a.m., and then uh, Pastor Galt's funeral at 2 p.m. on Thursday. And then Friday evening, 7 p.m., junior and senior Pathfinders start, so we need to be in prayer for that, and then at 8.15, straight youth. And, of course, I would imagine this week in our prayer meeting we'll be concentrating on these things starting up again. Then on Saturday evening at Eight, Youth Fellowship recommences, great, and uh, it's going to be pizza and games, so we can be in prayer for that as well with Chris and the, the team around them. And next Sunday, Sunday School at 10.15 and Sunday Fellowship, 10.15 as well, and the morning service next Sunday will be taken by Alistair, and then our evening service by Stephen Singleton, so we'll most likely get a report about IPI next Sunday evening as well. Uh, then looking further ahead, Thursday the 19th of September, Time Out Bible Study. Saturday the 5th of October, the Revive Ladies uh, Coffee Morning, and there's going to be a leaflet drop and associate with that on Friday the 20th of September. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, members meeting on Tuesday the 8th of October. The date's for your diary. I think that's all the announcements. I'm going to hand over to Alistair now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas, for doing all of that. Uh, we do appreciate that indeed, and leading the first part of our service. Now, I want to read just some verses from Galatians chapter 5. And in Galatians chapter 5, it, it sort of uh, compares two uh, lifestyles, if you like. We have the works of the flesh, and we have the works of the Spirit. And then when we come tonight to uh, preaching the Word of God, I want to look at Psalm number one, and again, that again compares to lifestyles in the Old Testament. But Galatians 5 and verse 16. So, Galatians 5 and verse 16. And Paul writing to the church, Galatia says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these, 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for all the songs that we've been singing tonight already. We thank You, Lord, for this reading from Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for the reminder of activities that are starting up and taking place, Lord, over this next incoming week and following. And Father, we just thank You tonight for the opportunity again to be in church and just to, to be involved in all of these things, of opportunity, Lord, to worship You. Father, we thank You for seeing the communion table prepared for us that, Lord, afterwards we might meet around it and remember your love for us and the death of Christ. Lord, we just thank you for all of these blessings that, Lord, you have bestowed upon us and given to us and, Lord, have just blessed us with. Lord, we just thank you. And, Father, as we compare these two lists that are given in your Word, oh, Lord, we thank you for salvation, and we thank you, Lord, for the change that it makes. And we thank You, Lord, that it lifts us out of this long list of sin and crime and evil and hurt. And Lord, we thank You that it sets us on a different path and a different course. Father, we thank You that when we come to know You, Lord, You can fill our heart with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness. Oh, and self-control. Father, we thank You for the change, the difference that the gospel makes, and Lord, the life that enables us to live. And Lord, lifts us out of the miry clay, and Lord, sets our feet upon a rock, and establishes our going, and Lord, makes us completely and totally different people. Lord, we thank You for the gospel. And Lord, we thank You, those of us tonight who know You. We thank You, Lord, for what the gospel has done for us. And Lord, we just praise You and worship You. Ah, Lord, just lift up Your name. Thank You, Lord, for what You mean to us. Father, we ask that You will draw near to us this night, Lord, and speak right into our hearts. Lord, put Your finger on those things that You still want to sort out within our lives. Those things, Lord, that need to be brought in line with your will and your word and plan. Lord, just minister to us this night, we pray. So we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Lord, for the possibilities of this meeting. And Lord, we bring to you tonight those, Lord, of our fellowship and further afield, Lord, who have heavy burdens, Lord, who are going through difficult times. We do think, Lord, of Pastor John Galt's family, his wife, his sons, his daughter in England. Lord, we pray that you will comfort them, strengthen them, help them. Lord, we do think of Nigel and Ruth Wilson, and Samuel and Eva, and the funeral of Nigel's dad tomorrow. Oh, we pray, Lord, as Nigel has a longing in his heart that somehow the gospel might be shared. Lord, we pray that you will help, that you will bring them strength and comfort blessing, we pray. Father, others in our fellowship, Lord, carrying burdens, Lord, we pray that you will draw near. 
Father, our heart goes tonight to, we think of Barbara, caring there for her mother, and Lord, the ongoing needs that, that she has. Father, we pray that you will, you will come to Barbara, but we pray, Lord, you will come to her mother. Bring healing and recovery, strength. Father, we think of others in her fellowship, like Pat and Ella, Matt Miller, many, Lord, carrying burdens. Lord, we just pray that you will come with healing, relief, strength. Lord, you know the children, young people of our church, back to school, secondary school, university, college. Lord, we pray that you'll protect them and keep them. We pray, Lord, you'll make the children's activities in our church a real blessing to those children, young people who know you. Oh, just a cause, Lord, for those who don't know you to come to know you. Lord, for all of us, you know the pressures that work bring. Lord, we pray that this week we will know help, strength, wisdom. Lord, we're looking to you for your blessing to be upon us, upon our fellowship and upon us personally and upon our families. Lord, we just bring our prayers and ourselves before you. Answer, Lord, for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again another lovely, lovely hymn. It's probably one of my favorite hymns. There is a higher throne than all this world has known, where faithful ones from every tongue will one day come. Let's stand and sing this lovely hymn together. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to follow in our reading, then we are going to look at Psalm number 1. There are just six verses, so we will take time to read the whole thing through. So, Psalm number 1, beginning at verse 1. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, again for being able to stand and sing and praise you. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask now, Lord, that as we come to your word, you will help us. That, Lord, you will enable us. You will enable us to listen. You will enable each of us to be obedient, myself included. And, Lord, that we might live in the light of your word. So, Lord, we look to you for your help. And, Lord, may you be glorified for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now, this morning we were looking in, in the book of James and just thinking about the Word of God and that we should receive the Word of God, receive it with meekness, and that we need to obey it, and that we need to put it into practice. And if we do that, it said at the end of verse 25, that the one, this one, will be blessed in all that he does. And thinking about that in light of coming to uh, start a new series in First Peter, and, and just thinking about studying the Bible throughout the winter as we come to it, week after week, day after day, and not just doing it and then it's just forgotten about, but actually taking the Word of God seriously, taking the Word of God to heart, actually living out the Word of God in our lives and reforming our lives in line with the Scriptures. And that's really the burden of what was on my heart and my mind for this day, that we might have that in our mind, that we might determine that in our mind and say, that's the way that I want to live. I, I want to live in light of the Word of God. That's why I was looking at those verses in, in James this morning about not just hearing the Word of God, but actually about doing what it says. And uh, we read that this morning. Be, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He who looks, looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. And then when you move into the Old Testament and, and look at it again, here it gives a description of the godly man and the ungodly man. Now, we just want to spend a little bit of time looking at the godly man or the righteous man, and uh, I'm sure sometime in the future, God willing, we will look at the other part of this psalm. But nevertheless, it brings to us the same teaching. It makes to us some of the same points and emphasizes what we want to think about regarding the Word of God. Now, we do not know really who wrote this psalm. I suppose people can presume, oh, it was David or it was somebody else, but it's not told to us who wrote Psalm 1. It is not given to us either as to what the occasion might have been for the writing of this psalm. But most commentators seem to feel that it is like an introduction to all the rest of the book of Psalms. And in this psalm, as we say, there are two lifestyles that are compared, the godly life and the ungodly. And as I say, we want to look at the godly life. Now, I wonder whenever you think uh, of speaking or talking of someone that you think is godly, what kind of comes to your mind when you think of a godly person? I'm sure all kinds of, of sort of pictures uh, can conjure up in your mind when you think of what a godly person might be like. Do you think of someone who's, you know, always speaking of religious things in kind of religious tones, you know, sort of like the way a, a vicar is portrayed in the TV. Well, you know, and, and they give that kind of, that kind of feeling. Oh, I know that doesn't do anything for me whatsoever, but it portrays that kind of 
empty kind of way that it is? Or do you think of someone who's always very serious in their mindset and, and wear that long kind of godly, holy sort of face? Or do you think of people who dress in a certain kind of way? Or, or I don't know what sort of picture it conjures up in your mind. All of those pictures just about put me off what you think godliness should look like. That's not how, how I want to view it. I wonder, would you consider yourself godly? Do you consider yourself a godly person? It's a strange kind of question. I don't know if you do or don't. I suppose the answer might be, well, I hope so. But it's not something you can testify to. Like if I stood up here tonight and I said, I know we're talking about a godly person, and I would just like to tell you all, you know that I'm really godly. You, right away you would say, woo hoo what's gone to his head? We'll have to deal with that. That'll come up tomorrow night in the deacon's meetings for sure. And you would be right. So it's not something you testify about. I'm quite happy to tell anybody, and I'm sure you are, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're quite happy to say, I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a sinner who's been converted. We're happy to talk about that, but you can't sort of testify and profess and talk about and tell people that you're a godly person. But I suppose in our heart we want to live a godly, righteous, God-glorifying life. And maybe we, I don't know, I've never really thought about it, but maybe, you know, we hope that others see that in us. I'm not sure if, if Martha Irvine will be, will be listening, or Heather, I'm not sure, but Jim Lyons, the Reverend Jim Lyons from Coleraine, uh, popped in to see uh, Martha just in, in hospital, in the Causeway Hospital, last week. And Jim's comment to me was, there's a touch of godliness about her. Now, she didn't announce it to him and say, now, Jim, I know you don't know me, but I'm really actually a very godly lady. You know, I go to straight. She didn't announce it to him but there was a sense of it about her life, a knowledge of God, a godliness, a love for the Lord, a devotion about her life that was evident that people could see. And we won't have that unless we are living in light of the Scriptures. Now, I think true godliness is something that everyone in the world has an inner longing for. You say, well, why do you think that? Well, it's what we lost at the fall when Adam and Eve sinned. We were created in the image of God. We were created perfect and to walk with Him. And there would be something of His image and godliness come through us. But we lost it. And we have an emptiness and yet Christ has come to redeem us and to bring us back to that place and to restore us and to restore within us the image of Christ and of godliness, that there might be something about our lives different than how everybody else lives. I wanted to read those verses in Galatians again that contrast two very different lifestyles and motivations and we long that we have a godliness about us. Now, it says here about the godly man, blessed is that man, truly happy is that man. And it said this morning in James, this one will be blessed in all that he does. There are tremendous blessings in knowing God and walking with God. And in fact, it says here in Psalm 1, blessed, it just means, oh, the blessedness is. I'm not sure if that's very good English, but it expresses what it is. It's more than one blessing. The blessedness is its ongoing, continual blessings. The blessings of walking with the Lord. The blessings of knowing the Lord. The blessings of knowing the Lord within our lives. The blessings of doing what the Scriptures here say. There's a joy, a blessedness, a happiness, a contentment, that no one else in the world can know. And when I say happiness, I don't just mean a bunch of, of laughs or lightness or trivial uh, things, but a deep down, genuine 
happiness. Now, what does a godly person do? We're told here in this psalm. So, let's, let's think about this for a moment or two again. So, verse 1, the company that a godly person does not keep. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. There's company that he does not keep. Now, we all live in the real world. We all work in the real world. We go to school in the real world. All of that, we're in, we're in contact with people. But there's a difference about how we live, and it's given to us here. He doesn't walk in the way of the ungodly. He draws back from it. He doesn't walk in the same course of life. He doesn't walk in the same direction. He's not motivated by the same things. There's a difference. We're not going in the same direction. The word counsel there is advice or plan or purpose or persuasion. We're just not living as the ungodly live, morally or in active breaking of God's laws. We're not living the same as the person who does not follow the Lord. There's a difference. The godly person does not live his life according to the advice, the plan, the direction, the lifestyle, the motivation of the ungodly. There's a difference. And sometimes we just need to recognize that in, in, in our own thinking. There's a difference. Human nature doesn't like to be different. We kind of like to just fit in. But the godly person lives a different life. It's just the way it is. It says he doesn't sit in the path of sinners. This is kind of like a step closer than, than the previous walking. It's not just advice and a plan here. Now, if you're going to, if you're going to stand in it, then, then you're, you're going to really be right in the course of life. And then the next bit, he doesn't sit with the scornful. Those who... <laughs> who have settled in to dwell with those who scoff and mock at the thought of God or sin or judgment or heaven or hell. And maybe you'll face that tomorrow as you go to school, or you'll face that at work, or you'll face it in your family. They'll say, well, what did you do yesterday? Oh, I, I went to church. Oh, I wouldn't be bothered with that. I didn't think you would do that. And there's a scoffing and a mocking. Listen, we don't, we don't sit with that. We don't rest with that. Spurgeon made a comment about that. He said, the godly person finds no rest with the atheist's scoffing. The godly man, godly woman lives a totally different lifestyle from the ungodly we don't fit in with it. We don't feel comfortable with it. We're not going to live in that way. That's why Jesus was preaching repentance, a change of mind, a change of direction. That's why Paul's ministry was about seeing people turn from darkness to light and from Satan to God. And there are many other places in the New Testament where, where the contrast is given, like in, in Corinthians 6. The godly person is going in a different direction. And in, in Corinthians 6, it says, you know, what can fellowship can light have with darkness? What fellowship can the devil have with Christ? What fellowship a believer with an unbeliever? And so on. Or you get the broad road and the narrow road. It's just to put it in our mind that there's a difference in how we live. If we belong to Christ, than those who don't. The godly person just doesn't fit into that. If you like, verse 1, could be, you could look at that and say, well, that's very negative, but it's true. We've repented of that lifestyle and that way of going and of that motivation, and we've turned to Christ, and we're following Christ, and we're obeying His Word, and we live differently. That's the way it is, a godly person. 
Secondly, the communion he doesn't forsake. The company he doesn't keep and the communion he doesn't forsake. Verse 2, he delights in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now we're back to what we were thinking about a little bit this morning in James, and it's where I, where I wanted to get to. The godly person delights in the law of the Lord. The word delight there means he takes pleasure. He counts it as valuable. It's a pleasant thing. It's something he desires, the law of the Lord. There's a longing in our heart for the Scriptures and the law of the Lord, and we just long to read it and be blessed by it and live in the light of it. Now, if you read through, through the book of Jeremiah, I, I think Jeremiah must have really known Psalm 1, and I, I do wonder sometimes if Psalm 1 was Jeremiah's favorite psalm, because if you read through, you'll, you'll find a number of a little references to Psalm 1, but he just says this, your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers. He must have been reading Psalm 1. He must have been reading it. Your word is a joy and rejoicing of my heart, and I don't sit in the assembly of the mockers. So, do you love, meditate, study the Scriptures? How, 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 does, how, how are you in your mind about the Scriptures? Do you look forward to picking it up and reading it? Do you delight in it? Do you look forward to hearing what it has got to say? Do you love spending time in it? The godly person delights in the law of the Lord. He loves the Scriptures. Secondly, he meditates in it day and night. He ponders it. He thinks about it. He chews it over, if you like, like an animal chewing its, its cut. He thinks deeply and seriously and affectionately and thoughtfully about it. Now, I try to read this, just talking myself, I try to read through the Bible roughly in a year. So, if you want to do that, you've got to read about three or four chapters a day, roughly speaking, and that'll take you through the Bible in a year. I can do that sometimes when you're reading, you know, through First and Second Chronicles, or you're wading your way through Leviticus, you know, or some of those stuff in Numbers, you know, and you do think to yourself, why in the world is this in the Bible? There must, I'm sure, be a purpose, but at this present point, I ain't seeing it. But anyway, here we go. I don't look forward to wading through, through some of that stuff, but I, tr I do try to read it. Say, well, these names must have been important, so I read it. But that's not necessarily the stuff that I meditate on. But I love to be reading the Scriptures and, and then you come to something, some verse, some thought, some line, and you think about it. And it stays with you. And you take it with you to work. And you take it with you on a journey in the car. And when your mind has a free moment or two, it's what you go back to think about and you ponder that particular truth. That is something that the Lord is saying to you. The godly person meditates on the Scriptures. The things that come alive to you. Like me with be doers of the Word. I've been thinking a bit about that. I'm going to mention a verse when we come around communion, and it came up on my reading about a week ago or something, and I've thought a little bit about it. It's something you're meditating, thinking about. Sometimes when that happens to me, I'll maybe get a commentary or two and read about what, what people say about it, that I might understand it, and that I might live in the light of it. The godly person loves the Scriptures. The godly person meditates, thinks about, ponders. I think the idea might sort of kind of be to talk to yourself about it. You think it through, and you put it into your, into your life and thinking. Meditate. Someone says it's reflective thought 
in a repetitive manner. You think about it, and then you go back to it, and then you go back to it, and you think it through. And it says there, day and night, and I think that's really just to give the idea of continually thinking about it. It's not just passed by quickly, you're thinking about it. Now, there are plenty of examples in the Scriptures, and I don't want to spend um, all, all night thinking about it. But you know what the Lord said to Joshua when He's beginning to lead, to lead the people? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's the very same promise. It's the very same truth. As it says in James, be doers of the Word, and the one who does this will be blessed. It's the very same truth as it is in Psalm 1. The godly person thinks about the Word of God. He meditates upon it, and he'll be blessed in it. It's the very same thing that God says to Joshua. Don't let the words of this, this law, you know, meditate in it day and night, and you'll be blessed. The truth of that surely has to be coming through. There are other places that I could pick up on and say Colossians chapter 3. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The word dwell there means to be at home. Remember what we said this morning about the Scriptures? We're to receive it as Rahab received the spies. She took them into her home. Take the Word of God to your heart like you would a friend to your home. Or Psalm 119, Your Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And James 1, be doers of the Word. So, question. Honestly, do you read the Scriptures personally yourself daily? You want to be a godly person. You want to get to know the Lord you want to live out the Christian life, you've got to read the Scriptures. I just recommend it to you. I try to pull it together for us from all parts of the Scripture. Encourage us to see the importance of it and get into the Scripture. Read it. Meditate in it. Think about it. Live it ponder it, study it. So, I say, do you read it daily? Do you think about it? Do you surrender to it? If not, would you consider doing it? Just reading it. Psalm 19, again, as much to say about the Scriptures, it would say, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, make you wise, rejoice your heart, bring you light, you'll be warned, and there's great reward. So, you have it in, a, you have it in another psalm. Psalm 119, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to God's Word. Now, here's my problem. I can read it, hear it, but forget it. Don't apply it. Don't meditate in it. Don't surrender to it. And I'm well capable of making personal excuses as to why I don't. Well, you know, it was actually a bit busy on Monday. Well, it's been a very busy week, you know, I've had a few demands well, I'm not really sure if that really applied to me. I think maybe I got that wrong. And I, I can just whittle it away, you know, if it gets too close to the bone for me. Let's not make excuses. Let's get a love for the Scriptures. Let's set aside time to read it. 
And let's think about it, meditate in it, apply it to our hearts. I'm also very good at applying scriptures to other people. You know, preachers can do that. Oh, isn't it such a shame that Billy's not here? This would have been good for him. Well, maybe it was good for me and forget about Billy, whoever he is. I can always apply it to other people. But pick up the Scriptures. Read it. Think about it. Apply it to yourself. Meditate in it. Live it. And the person who does this will be blessed. Well, look at verse 3. Again, the condition he, he continually displays. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. There's a promise again. Do the Word, this one will be blessed. Psalm 1, read the Scriptures, delight in it, meditate upon it, and you'll be like a tree planted by the river, bringing forth fruit whose leaf does not wither. What a picture. What a picture. A fruitful picture. Now, the word planted there is a very interesting kind of, kind of word. It means transplanted or purposefully planted. This tree that the psalmist is talking about is not just some wild tree that happens to be there growing by chance. He's speaking of a tree that's purposefully planted. So he's saying, meditate on the Scriptures. Apply it to yourself. You'll be like a tree that's purposely planted beside the water. It'll be no accident. It's not just sort of some kind of luck that we're a godly person. No, no, there's, there's purpose about this thing. We're purposefully planted. I think the picture is of some kind of, we don't need irrigation in this country, we just get it steady, you know, morning to night, week after week. But in, in, in countries that, you know, don't get as much rain as us, and there are countries like that around the world, although we don't realize it, but what they do, they have to do irrigation, so they cut little, little water channels down between trees or, or plants or vegetation, whatever it is, and they can turn the water off and on that it runs down between whatever they're trying to grow. I remember being in, in Nigeria with Sharon's folks, and in their particular area, it was good for growing onions, but it's exceptionally dry. But they could pump water or turn water from the river down all these little channels that they would have all the water they need. When they had enough, they cut it off. When they needed more, they gave it. But the onions were purposefully planted where water would be. The psalmist says, if you get into the Scriptures, You'll be like a tree that's purposefully planted beside water. It's an amazing, fruitful picture, a supply. Listen, at our salvation, we are planted, engrafted into Christ. And we have everything that we need for salvation and godliness. It's all given. There's nothing lacking. It's all there. Philippians 4, 19, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The picture of John 15 Christ's the vine and we're the branch. All that is needed, all the sap that is needed, it's given. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, for he is the living water. Read Ephesians chapter 3 or, and chapter 5, that we have received the fullness of Christ, or that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. In Christ, there's everything we could ever need for life and godliness. It's been provided. Forgiveness, new birth, 
spiritual life, forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, His Word and promises. It's all there. The truth of the matter is we are without excuse for not living a godly life. We're planted in Christ, and in Christ there's all we need. He tells about it in the Scriptures. We know Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. Compare that with Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not the hope of heaven. No, I don't think really anywhere in the New Testament it speaks of heaven as glory. We, we talk about, oh, you know, he's gone to glory. No, it doesn't say that. For all have fallen short of the glory of God, the standard of God. What it says, Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the same word. Listen, Christ inside us can live His life through us and fill us that we can live a godly life. All the resources are there. It says about this tree, it's purposefully planted, and it brings forth its fruit in its season. Now, we're to bring forth fruit in their, in their season. Now, our gifts, and there's always controversy around the spiritual gifts, and our gifts are different. But there's no controversy around the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We'll bear our fruit. Listen, if we're in Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit and obeying His Word, we'll produce the fruit of the Spirit in its season. So, love. The opposite to love, just to help us get the picture, is selfishness. So, we'll not be selfish. There'll be love. Joy, the opposite to joy is discontent or whinging. Peace, the opposite to peace is over anguish or worry. Patience, the opposite is impatience or giving up. Kindness, the opposite is hardness. Goodness, the opposite is meanness. Goodness is actually love in action. That's why we talk about the good Samaritan or the good shepherd. Out of a heart of love, it's, it's in action in goodness. Faith or faithfulness and the opposite is untrustworthy. Meekness and gentleness, the opposite is pride. And self-control, the opposite is no self-control. Listen. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. He meditates in it day and night. He'll find all the resources that he could possibly need that's in Christ. And he'll be like a tree that's purposely planted beside a source, the waters. And he'll bring forth fruit in the season. Times when it's difficult, you'll see patience and endurance times when it's very difficult, you'll see peace beyond our understanding. Times when it's difficult, it'll not be discontent and whinging, but you'll see it joy. And out of their life, it'll not be a selfishness. It'll be a giving. It'll be a love. And it'll not be pride, but it'll be meekness and gentleness. Friends, it's great to meet, to live with, to work with, Someone, a Christian, who's bearing fruit in its season, in a godly life. Then it says, whose leaf will not wither. No matter the circumstances or the season, winter or summer, they're consistent. Spurgeon, in his kind of unique way of saying things, said this, this tree does not lose its beauty or its fruitfulness. This tree does not lose its beauty or its fruitfulness. Friends, we want to live the kind of life that does not 
lose its godliness and its beauty and its fruitfulness and usefulness. If we're going to do that, we need to be in the, we need to be in the Scriptures. Better finish. It says, and whatever he does shall prosper. Again, Spurgeon says it's not outward prosperity which the Christian most desires and cherishes. It's spiritual prosperity. Let me finish with this. Jeremiah, again, because I'm saying he's, he's been in this in the psalm. You'll find it in chapter 15. You'll find it in chapter 17 and verses 7 and 8. It says this, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. He will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green. He will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Anybody think that Jeremiah was familiar with Psalm number one? He was quoting Psalm number one there. And he had many difficulties and many sorrows and known as the weeping prophet. But even when the heat comes, even when drought comes, when difficulties come, they will still be bearing fruit. Okay, let's finish. Don't just be hearers of the Word, be doers of the Word and this one will be blessed. The godly man doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful, but he meditates in the Scriptures, and he meditates in it day and night, and he will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that will bring forth fruit in its season, and his leaf you know, won't fall off, and he'll prosper in whatever he does. Friends, the Scriptures are vitally important for our spiritual life. The reading of it, the meditating in it, obedience to it, and we'll be blessed. Are we people who are committed to reading the Scriptures, obeying the Scriptures, living the Scriptures. We want to grow as a Christian. Then that's what we have got to do. May the Lord just help us to really love His Word and be blessed in it and benefit by it. We're going to sing our, our final uh, song together. It is Breathe On Me, Breath of God. Then we are going to meet for a few minutes um, around the communion table. And as Thomas said, if you know and love the Lord, then please, please wait with us uh, and, and meet around the Lord's table. If you don't know the Lord, there's nobody, nobody asking you to leave. Please feel free to sit where you are and just let uh, the bread and wine pass by, and nobody will pass any judgment whatsoever upon you. Please wait with us if you can. If you can't, I understand that. But if you know and love the Lord, it's great just to spend those five or ten minutes just around the Lord's table. Thanks, Brenda.
Father, I thank you that your word is a living word. And Father, I thank you that you can breathe life into it. That, Lord, when we read it, it's like a two-edged sword that pierces right to our very heart. It's like a hammer, it says, which breaks the rock apart. It's like a fire that burns within our soul. Father, I ask that you will give us a love for your word, that your word will speak into our hearts, that, Lord, we will put it into practice, and, Lord, that we will be blessed, and, Lord, you will enable us to be godly people who live godly lives, who produce fruit in its season, Lord, who bear witness and testimony to a lost world around us. Father, thank you for what your salvation can do. And thank you that in Jesus we have all that we would ever need to live a godly life. Help us, we pray, Lord. Thank you for your presence with us today. Meet with us around your table. Help us to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name we commit ourselves to you. Amen. Amen. We'll just wait a couple of minutes. If you've got to go, we understand. But can I really encourage you, take a few minutes and wait with us if you can. Thank you. Let's just pray together, please. Father, we thank you again for uh, your help given to us, your presence with us this day. Thank you, Lord, that there's a desire in our heart to be in your house, be with your people. Lord, thank you that there's a desire in our heart tonight to meet around your table. And Lord, just to be still, and Lord, just to worship, and just to praise you and thank you for all that you have done for us, Lord, even when we didn't know it and when we, well, we never deserve it. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this little service. Thank you, Lord, for time to meet like this tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the joys that you give to us. We just praise you and worship you. We ask you, Lord, that you'll be glorified, and we ask, Lord, that you will draw near to us and speak to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read some verses from uh, the beginning of the book of Galatians, just actually the first five. So, Galatians 1, verses 1 through 5. 
And it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who were with me, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And it was just that verse 4, just reading it recently a few mornings ago, uh, just thinking, who gave Himself for our sins. And just in my own Bible reading, just reading through this, who gave Himself for our sins, that He might deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus, who gave Himself. He didn't need to, but the reason that He did, He did it for our sins, for our offenses. And actually the word sins there is for our missing of the mark, for our falling short of His glory and His standard and what He had, had written for us. Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins are missing of the mark. And we come to this little service to remember what Jesus did. And the reason He did it was for our sins. He had no need to do it. That's grace, because He had no sins of His own. But He did it for our sins. And the purpose that He did it, if you like, that He might deliver us from this present evil age. The idea is that He might rescue us those who can't rescue themselves, those who are hopelessly lost. He gave Himself for us. The truth of the matter is, if Jesus Christ had not given Himself for us here tonight, we would have no salvation. We would have no hope. We would not be in heaven. We would not know sins forgiven. Our lives would be lived like some of those lists that we read in emptiness and wickedness and sin, and we acknowledge tonight what the Lord has redeemed us from. He gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. What we see happening in the world around us He's actually delivered us from it, rescued us from it, saved us from it, not even speaking of what's happening and will happen for eternity for the moment, but just the wicked world. He's actually delivered us from it. My, what salvation has kept us from? Well, we want to worship Him and praise Him. And I often think about that. I think without this salvation, without the grace of God, where would I be? And the truth is, I could have been in a Christless hell for eternity by now. But Jesus died for me, that He might deliver me from this present evil age, and oh, that He might deliver us ultimately at the end when He comes and there's the final trumpet, and we only do this here until He comes. It reminds us until He comes and He's coming, but He's delivered us from this present wicked world, and He'll deliver us from a lost eternity. And then verse 5 just says, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We come to remember what He's done. Let's worship Him, praise Him, thank Him. That's what this is about, just worshiping We'll take a moment or two just in silence just to, just to worship Him, and then I'm going to ask Thomas if he will just give thanks for the bread. We will do what we normally do when the bread is served. Please just eat in your own time, and then a little later Mike will pray for the wine, and we will just hold that and drink it together as a sense of communion and fellowship and oneness in Christ. But let's just take a moment or two just to 
just to think what Christ has done, who gave Himself for us, that He might deliver us from this present evil age. He did it according to the will of God the Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we meet around your table tonight to remember what you have done for us, that you have saved us from our sins. Lord Jesus, you who, the creator of this world and sustainer of this world, took on human flesh because there was no other way. There was no other good enough to pay the price for sin. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we thank you for your cross where justice and mercy meet. You who knew no sin took our sin upon you so that we might go free. So, Lord, as we meet around your table tonight, we remember the body, your body that was broken, as you were nailed to that cross for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 As it says in, in Corinthians, and Paul was saying that uh, he just took the cup when he had given thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So whatever else happens to be taking part in life, let's just spend these few moments as we, as we take this bread. Let's just eat it in remembrance that Jesus gave his body for us. Thank you. Amen. Lord God, as we take this time this evening, Lord, to, to remember and reflect, Lord, we thank you for these, these physical reminders of, of what your son did on the cross. Lord, we thank you for the time to be quiet and consider these things again, Lord, but we thank you for, for that great price that was paid. Lord, we thank you for your son and for his birth and for his death. Lord, we thank you for the life that he led to lead up to that death, Lord, and for how he died and suffered in pain for us, Lord, because we know that we were helpless without him. Lord, we know that no one else could pay that price, no one else would pay that price. And Lord, we thank you for what he has done for us, Lord, because we are hopeless without it. 
And so, Lord, we thank you for that blood that was shed in our place, Lord, knowing that we, we deserve that death. Amen. And then we'll just distribute these little glasses and then just please hold on to them and uh, then we will drink together in a moment. Thanks, Matt. And we know what Paul said in the, in the next verse. It says this in the same manner. Uh, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it together in remembrance of me. So let's drink together in fellowship in remembrance of Christ. Amen. Brenda's picked for us a very nice uh, closing song. Just there is a Redeemer. It will come on the screen, and uh, we will stand and just sing this worshipfully, thoughtfully, and to the Lord together. Thank you.
Uh, Father, we just praise you for all that you have done for us. And as we read those few verses in Galatians, it said that it was done according to your will. Father, I thank you that you willed, you planned, you gave, you loved, you provided, and you sent us a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you, Lord, for revealing that to us. Thank you, Lord, for your great salvation. Oh, Father, help us to live it with joy, to live it out before a world that's lost. Help us, Lord, to share it as you give us every opportunity. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for your great salvation, committing ourselves to your care and keeping. Lord, remembering those in our family circle who don't know what we're rejoicing in, Lord, have mercy upon them and bring them to know you, we ask. So we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again. God bless you.